take the word conservative and they use it as a weird label and they demonize it and all sorts of things and I never knew I was a conservative but I kept being told I'm one so I guess I am but uh, I'd never actually uh, stuck to the label there was briefly a conservative party in Australia wasn't there Boyd very briefly and it was pretty good and you know maybe it'll be back again in some other form but um, my definition is of the word conservative is basically common sense decent fundamental looks at the facts and nearly always really, really nice. The most conservative person I know that fits that definition, absolute common sense, one of the nicest people I know, but smart as a whip, and we love having her on Outsiders, is the Senator from Queensland, Senator Amanda Stoker. Thank you, that is beyond kind. Oh, thank you. Hello everybody, thank you very much for the warm welcome. That is just so generous and um, there's so many people to acknowledge in the room, so you're going to have to forgive me for um, not acknowledging them all, but to, to everybody from um, my parliamentary colleagues, past and present, for, to Matt and Dan from um, the American Conservative Union, um, the Congressman Mark Meadows, it's wonderful to have you in the room, and um, many friends from across the country, it's just a joy to be here with you. But there is another person I'd like to acknowledge before I begin, and that's Senator Keneally. Um, we all owe her a debt of gratitude, don't we? The, the woman who doesn't know the difference between hate speech and speech that she hates. And the woman who has made it abundantly clear why it is that politicians shouldn't have the option of censoring the scope of debate. Because if she had any chance to do so, she'd be doing it in an arbitrary and totalitarian way something about which we should all be scared. So, I don't think it's outrageous to say that neither I nor any of us would agree with everybody in this room. We, we don't share a common brain, we can all think for ourselves. But I support our right and everybody's right to express their ideas, to debate one another, to be creative, to be sometimes right and sometimes wrong. And the reason for it is that we are all better because of the process of free speech in action. So, thank you. So, and that's why, much as she doesn't seem to get it, attempts to de-platform are just so counterproductive. They encourage people not to even enter into a room unless they've checked every speech, opinion, tweet, every possible faux pas of every other person in the room before they decide to enter. And that's so stupid and so counterproductive. If as a politician you are doing your job right, you will be talking to people from all walks of life with all kinds of different perspectives all the time. And can I say it's extra important that we spend time with people that we disagree with? because sitting in a bubble filled with people nodding in agreement serves nobody. When somebody is seriously wrong, they need to be heard, challenged and persuaded to better ideas. And I look forward to um, hearing and sharing some of those over the course of the weekend. Um, one of the strengths of a conference like this is the fact that we can toss around some ideas and be a little bit creative. I'm so pleased if it's okay for me to say, with how the Prime Minister, our Treasurer, our Finance Minister and our new IR Minister um, in Christian Porter have got stuck into their responsibilities. So in all of the things that I will come to say, don't think I'm criticising any of them. I think they're doing an amazing job. But I'd like to offer some ideas about where we go to next and offer some encouragement to be open-minded about the ways that we try and do small but significant politically achievable things to improve Australia's productivity. A little bit of a different topic for me. If you're expecting um, something on culture, um, you might be disappointed. If you bought a ticket expecting me to start a race riot, because I know Christina promised that to you all, um, <laughs> I'm so sorry I'm going to disappoint you. You can direct complaints to her office because it was, it was she who unreasonably raised expectations, but that's really just not my style. Um, so you're going to have to send your complaints her way. But, but more seriously, 
there is a moral and a political imperative to improve Australia's productivity. Now, that is a shocker of a word, and most people don't even, I think, really understand what it means. They kind of glaze over when they hear the word. But it really matters. It's moral because when we improve the productivity of our economy, it delivers more jobs to the people in our community who need them most, people on the margins of employment. It's moral because it's necessary to give higher wages to people who we know in our community are struggling with the cost of living. And it's moral because when we do it, it reduces the cost of living. And that's a triple whammy that we can't ignore. It's also a political imperative because if we don't create real improvements in wages and help people cope with the cost of living, which we know is very high in Australia, we will ultimately pay a political price for it. It's part of the reason that the coalition was entrusted with government over Labor's high taxing agenda. Now, one of the most obvious areas in which we can make improvements of this kind is in industrial relations. But given the scars of 2007, it's not surprising that um, there are many people who are reluctant to go there. But we can't forget, this stuff is really important to people who, in our community who have less. And Labor's instinct to re-regulate work is harmful, both to marginally employed people and to specific sectors. I'm going to go through a couple of those, and I hope in the course of this talk I'll highlight a couple of the simple, I think quite saleable things we can do um, to make our economy work better for all people, but particularly people um, who won't know what the word productivity means. There's real and concerning issues that arise from some of our state-based industrial relations regimes. One example I can give you is the way that we regulate labour hire. If there's a national labour hire company, it faces seven different regulatory regimes with which they must comply. Now, I'm a federalist. Prima facie, I don't disagree with the idea that there might be differences. Uh, Harmonisation isn't always a great thing. Um, but three states have passed specific labour hire laws in Australia, Queensland, Victoria and South Australia, without there being a clear reason for doing so, other than the fact that Labor just doesn't like Labor hire and they want to make it difficult for them. Each one of those acts makes it an offence to engage in the Labor hire trade without a licence or to engage the services of an unlicensed Labor hire firm. And while the offences themselves are similar, there's a lot of variation in the penalties that are imposed from state to state. In Victoria, there's no criminal penalties, whereas in Australia and South Australia, sorry, Queensland and South Australia, um, some of them attract terms of imprisonment as well as significant pecuniary penalties. In all cases, um, they are significant wax for doing something no worse than hooking a person up with a job. It's crazy, right? And it's not clear to me why there should be anything that is, you know, particularly needing special regulation about labour hire. It's not as though it poses a higher risk to safety or a greater likelihood of exploitation than you'd find in other areas of employment. It's something that's got to change and it shouldn't be hard to do. Awards are another area that are desperately in need of improvement. If I had a dollar for every time a constituent came through my door to complain that the modern awards system is unworkably complex, I'd be doing all right. The Gillard government's attempt to aggregate lots of disparate awards into the modern award system ultimately had the result of delivering the worst of all possible worlds. It means there is now ridiculous complexity in many of them, and there's occasionally nonsensical requirements, things that, that just don't add up, they're not practical. And they reflect the fact that in the process they've tried to please every union and each one of their vested interests in each of the predecessor awards. If we're being honest, we need to accept that this unreasonable complexity has played a part in at least some of the cases we've heard about in recent months about the underpayment of staff. Small and medium-sized businesses often come to me and say that the award system is so difficult for them to navigate that they're either paying expensive consultants that they can't truly afford to help make sure that they can do their payroll correctly, or they're terrified that they might be making an error because they know that the consequences, which are civil, criminal and reputational, 
would absolutely crush them. Now, yes, some people do the wrong thing and underpay their staff, and, of course, that's unacceptable. They should have the book thrown at them. But there's plenty of evidence to show that complexity is causing errors that manifest as workers getting shortchanged. And that's not good enough. The benefits of getting business owners and managers away from obsessing over their payroll by simplifying awards and getting them back into their operations would be significant for the output of small and medium-sized businesses. There's scope, too, for improving the way we do IR by making enterprise bargaining agreements fit the nature of major construction or project-based work. There's no sensible reason why major projects, particularly in construction and infrastructure, shouldn't have project-long EBAs. And yet, that's not how it's currently done. Doing so would allow each project to have certainty about the labour costs they face and prevent unions from using a mid-project EBA negotiation to engage in inappropriate industrial action, knowing that they've got the builder over a barrel because the costs of delay at that point are extreme. Another area where we could make simple but significant improvements is that we remain in an unacceptable situation where there is continued uncertainty about what it means to be a casual worker in this country. How many years have we been going on with this stuff? We should be beyond the point of making arguments for the value of casual employment. While it's not for everybody, and I acknowledge that, for many workers, it's a preference. There are substantially higher rates of pay in exchange for the great, greater certainty and loadings that come with permanent work. And for some employers whose work rate or um, workflow fluctuates, it's vital to managing their resources well. And yet, there was a case last year called the WorkPack case, in which the federal court held that a casual employee who had a regular timetable of hours was in fact a permanent employee with entitlements to the leave, benefits and other loadings that come with permanency. You can imagine the uncertainty that created. The court didn't, though, engage with the question of whether the employees in this situation had to either give up or offset that casual leave loading they get paid, which is in the order of 25%. Um, as an offset for getting all of those benefits, making something of a choice or an election. Indeed, the casual observer of the court's decision would have read it to mean that casual workers just get both, like it comes from nowhere. And you can imagine the problems this causes. Law firms started going on the hunt for staff for whom they could run claims for historical back pay, reflecting the right to have both sets of benefits in effect, inviting casual workers to take a double dip, having already been compensated for the benefits and uncertainty with the payment of casual leave loading to them. Employers had no certainty about the rate at which they should be paying their casual staff, and unions loved it because they hate casual employment arrangements anyway, mostly because they're people who are less likely to be union members. And so... As you would expect from the coalition, they tried to propose a sensible solution. Let casual employees who have a regular timetable of hours going over an extended period, say 12 months or more, the kind of people who were meant to be captured by the case, make their own choice. Fancy that. Let workers choose. And if they want to remain casual, they can do so on their original terms. But if they want to get the benefits of permanency, well, then they can do that too, electing to shift over to the system where you get the benefits but the lower rate. It was fair. It put power back into employees' hands where there was a risk that the casual category might be being used for ways in which it was not intended. And it gave certainty for employers that they wouldn't face double-dipping claims. And Labor have refused every day of the week to back it. Uncertainty about what it means to be a casual employee needs to be resolved if we're going to make it as easy as possible for people to take new staff on. Right now, it's a real block to workforce growth. The answer should be simple, plain as day. You're a casual employee if you're contracted to work as one and you're paid as one. Doesn't sound like rocket science. 
But at the moment, there are a range of tests and considerations that go into determining the issue that mean an employer can't really be sure if they're doing the right thing until a court's decided on it. And that's just not a reasonable basis upon which to run a business, particularly if you're at the small to medium-sized end. There's nothing unfair about the simplicity of this definition either. In the context of there being a right of election in the hands of employees who find themselves casual for the long term and working the patterns of a permanent employee. Indeed, when I go around my state, I find there are heaps of workers who say they would choose to stay casual if given the choice. And they want to have that choice, but casual's where they want to be because they want to pocket the extra cash for their mortgage or for their school fees now, knowing, prepared to back themselves as the kind of employee that they know doesn't draw down on the full suite of benefits and knowing that with their performance, they're never going to be short of an opportunity. You cannot overestimate how important the option of being able to hire a casual is to a small but growing business. They want to put somebody on, but they don't have the certainty for themselves about what the outlook will look like in the months ahead. And anyone who's been in small or medium-sized business before knows it's always the owners that are the last to get paid. But if we're to grow as an economy, we need to make it as simple as possible for our businesses to take that risk. And fair, certain terms around casual employment are vital to that task. It would be remiss of me to be talking about industrial relations and the ways that it is blocking growth to do so without talking about the ways that the application of unfair dismissal laws are hurting small and medium-sized businesses. Just as uncertainty about casual employment arrangements stop a business from hiring, so too does the threat of litigation from a staff member that's just not working out. Faced with the risk that they won't be able to get rid of an underperforming staff member without giving them a handsome payout or enduring the costs of defending their call in the courts, many employers just say it's all too hard and don't put someone on, even when they want to. And that comes with a real price. If every small business in this country took on just one person, there would be no unemployment. Zero. No one puts off an employee who is truly adding value unless that business is in dire straits. I think that is just a truth so obvious as to be self-evident. It should be enough, especially in small and medium-sized businesses, to be able to just make the call that a person isn't the right fit. That's best for everyone in the long term. Moving on. The Ensuring Integrity Bill is critical, and it deals with some of the Hayden Royal Commission's most serious concerns. You will have, I hope, followed that Royal Commission. But in it, former Justice Dyson Hayden came up with an enormous number of recommendations over the nine months and 70 public and private hearings he held with 229 witnesses. Those 79 recommendations ranged from banning individuals from being office bearers if they are found guilty of crimes with sentences of more than five years, to deregistering organisations that perpetually thumb their nose at court orders and decisions. 30 individuals referred, were referred to other agencies, including the police, with 50 civil and criminal matters prosecuted as a consequence. Labor was so quick, weren't they, to demand swift action following the Banking Royal Commission. They loved doing that, but there's been nothing but crickets from them when it came to dealing with the recommendations of the Hayden Royal Commission. I've got no problem with unions being a part of our economic landscape. And historically, they had an important role to play. But they've got to honour their promise to members. And they can't be operating as thugs or standover men. And so we've got to clean them up. Just as Hayden said in his report to the government, in many parts of the world constituted by Australian trade union officials, there is room for louts, thugs, Bullies, thieves, perjurers, those who threaten violence, errant fiduciaries and organisers of boycotts. What a crowd, hey? Um, but as late as last month, the CFMMEU had 79 of its representatives before the courts in 37 separate cases brought by the Australian Building and Construction Commission for an alleged 800 separate contraventions of workplace law. These are not the good guys. What are these offences, though? 
Well, in Justice Hayden's report, he listed some things that seemed, you know, to the first blush, seemingly minor. And I'll give you an example. A CFMMEU organiser insisted that a bricklayer, who charged $4 per brick laid, increase his rate to fall in line with the unionised bricklayer at $6 a block. Now, you might go, two bucks, big deal. But it effectively fixed the price on the site and it removed competition, artificially increasing costs for the builder and for the purchaser alike. It doesn't just harm the builder, it harms the cost of living. It harms the cost of the final product to the consumer. Including, when you think about it, that bricklayer himself. It might seem small, but you multiply that $2 per brick across the project, multiply it across the buildings being constructed across that city or across this country, and we've got a real drain on our economy. But he also identified more serious offences, like the breach of privacy and trust that occurred when building industry superfund CBUS was strong-armed by CFMMEU officials into giving the names and addresses of fund members to the union so they could be used to foment industrial unrest on work sites. It's not a small thing. These practices are not just illegal, but they harm everyone because they harm our productivity. They stop us from being able to keep costs down, and that is in all of our interests. While some of these things mightn't seem like big deals, when you think about the fact that the CFMMEU alone has accumulated 2,000 of these offences and $16 million in combined fines over recent years, the impact starts to aggregate. They've been described as the most recidivist corporate offender in Australian history by a Federal Circuit Court judge, possessing a record that ought to be an embarrassment to the trade union movement. And there are signs from some in the union sector that they are embarrassed by militant unions like this. The Australian Nurses and Midwifery Union is currently lobbying Tasmanian Senator Jackie Lambie not to vote with the government on the Ensuring Integrity Bill. They've said, none of us condone the behaviour of the CFMMEU and certainly appreciate that there needs to be greater compliance and transparency, but not at the expense of those of us who are doing the right thing. Interestingly, it's not the head of the ACTU, Sally McManus, who's doing that lobbying, but the former head, now Labor MP Ged Kearney. Perhaps because McManus is on the record as saying she only believes in the rule of law when it's for laws with which she agrees. <laughs> Another way that the role of unions could be made to be more efficient is to facilitate greater competition between unions. What's known as the conveniently belong rule has been used to maintain effective union monopolies in most industries in Australia with no obvious justification. Indeed, it can facilitate some of the worst union behaviour, allowing it to go unchecked by the civilising force that is competition. There are many people who want to be a member of a union simply for the basics, to have access to professional insurances and legal advice if something goes wrong. Some want some representation at bargaining time, but they're not in the market for militancy, and they certainly don't want to become permanent donors to the Labor Party or the funders of a permanent squad of Labor-aligned campaigners. And yet, in most industries, this simpler option just isn't available. Compare, though, the improvements for Queensland nurses that have occurred since the Nurses Professional Association of Queensland was established in competition to the Queensland Nurses and Midwives Union, the second of which is Labor-aligned. The NPAQ charges a fraction of the fees, offering the insurances, the legal help and the bargaining representation, but none of the money that is siphoned off to the union's political and less reputable activities. I'm not anti-union, but I am against unions exploiting vulnerable and low-paid workers for their own ends. Which brings us to another element of union corruption, the way they misuse, oftentimes, workers' funds. For a long time, union funds have um, been kept for access during times of injury or redundancy, for legal fees when facing dismissal and so on. But Justice Hayden found these were being widely rorted by the unions. At least $30 million of workers' money is siphoned annually, annually, from the union's audited accounts into funds like these. In just one example, Justice Hayden found hard evidence of five generic funds attached to the Australian Workers' Union alone. They were set up outside the audited accounts and established for unspecified purposes. 
I dare say many union members wouldn't even know about the existence of these funds. But employers were forced to contribute to them, often through conditions in enterprise agreements. And because of the secret nature of the funds, they were, more often than they should have been, deployed for the benefit of union officials rather than the members they are designed to serve. If a chief executive of a bank had a secret slush fund to tap into for home renovations or for donations to their favourite political party, do you think Labor would turn a blind eye? Do you think Senator Christina would turn a blind eye? <laughs> the Morrison government's reintroduced the Ensuring Integrity Bill, which will clean up the systemic corruption in the union sector. But we are going to have to fight for it because despite all the evidence, Labor just won't get there. The bill does three things. It provides for disqualifying union officials who demonstrate disregard for the law, and it expands the grounds for automatic disqualification. If you're a recidivist lawbreaker, you shouldn't be running an organisation where you are entrusted with the funds and the rights of others. The standard should be nothing less than that which we expect for the people who run a corporation. It provides for organisations to be deregistered where there is systemic or cultural corruption, and it provides for the administration of seriously dysfunctional um, organisations. The simple fact is, it applies equally to employer groups as it does to unions. It passes the pub test, asking them to do only what we would expect for every other organisation we have in our community, whether it's a not-for-profit through to a company. And if we don't deal with union lawlessness, it will be our productivity, that word again, what it really means, it will be the take-home pay of all Australians that suffers. None of this is anti-worker. It is about getting the best possible deal for every Australian who works and getting them the best-priced goods that they can spend their take-home pay on. It is a great deal for Australians who work. Which, of course, leads me to superannuation. I think we need to be honest and open-minded about the impact of forcing increases in the compulsory superannuation contribution. There is no doubt that taking responsibility for your income in old age is the right thing to do. But for some, it's become a sacred cow that can't even be discussed or critically examined, even with the object of improving it. In 2010, the Gillard government legislated for contributions to increase from 9% to 12% by 2020. And they're expected to be covered by employers. So where's it going to come from? It's either going to come from cuts to employee numbers or cuts to profits, which ultimately feed into reinvestment, the ability to take on more staff. And if we cut profits, we cut the ability of employers to raise wages, which we know Australians are waiting for. Add to that 3% the on cost of CPI increases to wages and you've got a cumulative effect year on year. Then that's subject to payroll taxes at the state level, and you'll be impacted in the thresholds there by the increases to the super rate. All of this will have a real and negative impact on jobs and wages, just as it did when it was introduced in 1992. The coalition deferred the latest increases until 2025, but it will still have an impact on employers' bottom lines. And in the case of marginal small businesses, it might mean the difference. Indeed, it will mean the difference between whether or not to take on that extra employee. We've got to be honest about the inefficiency of the super sector in Australia. It's among the most expensive in the world, and providing it with more funds to manage, compulsorily, giving workers no real say, before we require it to lift its game, will give it more financial and political power without paying the price of improved member balances, especially by ensuring lower fees. That's just not on in circumstances where Australians pay the highest superannuation fees of all of the OECD. And then, on top of that, there are the fees for advice. In 2017, 10 retail funds collected around $1.4 billion of advice fee revenue. Members were charged about $341 per account. And most people don't realise that industry super funds charge this of everybody as a flat rate. They don't even know they're paying for it. They're certainly not using it, for the most part. And then there are the dormant accounts, of which there are 10 million unintentionally um, wandering around, being charged variable fees for a percentage of the balance. 
when you apply fees to these inactive accounts, they get eaten away pretty fast. And that's part of the reason why the Morrison government brought in the protecting your superannuation package, to stop dormant accounts from being whittled away by fees and insurance premiums for products that just aren't being used. This is good news for those who have super accounts, um, who find that their um, provider use unreasonable administrative requirements to make it near impossible to shut down old or dormant accounts, an experience many people report to me. And the time remaining, let me touch on a few other things that we've got to get doing to help get our economy moving. We've got to remove bureaucratic roadblocks to growth. There must be real consequences for those who would seek to use lawfare to hold up major projects, particularly in mining and water infrastructure, in an effort to cause sufficient delay and costs as to make projects uncommercial. Objectors must, as a condition of being able to participate in litigation, be required to show that they're affected by a project in a direct sense and to face the reality of cost orders when their actions amount to an abusive process. And too rarely is that the case at the present time. Lawfare is a relatively, you know, in the last decade, new strategy of the green movement, where once a greenie would just chain themselves to a bulldozer to stop a project going ahead, they'll now tie up the approvals process in court. And that's not to say they don't occasionally still chain themselves to the heavy machinery, or jam their hands into a cement-filled barrel or lie on train tracks, as they all have recently, in an attempt to stop movement in and out of the Adani Carmichael site. But if we take the example of, of Adani, they've had to fight challenges to the mine's approvals in the Federal Court from the Mackay Conservation Group, the Australian Conservation Foundation, twice, in the Queensland Land Court from the Land Services of Coast and Country Incorporated, and not all of these are the local benign organisations you would think they are. They take money from afar and influence and guidance from well beyond the local area. The Abbott Point Coal Terminal has been challenged by the North Queensland Conservation Council and the AAT. Again, the Mackay Conservation Group in the Federal Court, the Alliance to Save Hinchinbrook in the Federal Court and the Queensland Supreme Court from a challenge from the Whitsunday Residents Against Dumping. Again, a whole bunch of front organisations all of which have this hard green agenda. In addition, there were native title issues raised by a, a small number of traditional owners and the challenge from the Wangan and Jagalanau people um, delayed the mine for three years through the native title tribunal. Given the first announcement of the mine was made by Anna Bly in 2010 and the first excavations were only being made just last month, it is no wonder that so many investors say it's just too hard to do business in Australia. It's something we have to address and urgently. And this isn't about serving the interests of a giant mining company. This is about the thousands of out-of-work men and women in Rockhampton, Townsville, throughout central Queensland and indeed countrywide who badly want to get to work. Despite meeting over 180 conditions, it still took the Labor government in Queensland kicking and screaming to get them over the line. It is no wonder it is so hard to do business here, why it's more appealing for many to take their mining work to South America than it is to Australia. It is an urgent imperative to turn this around. Let me conclude with something that's... Um, a little bit more creative, because I think it's really important in forums like this that we do toss around some ideas that are a little bit more out there. We need to be investing in visionary energy and water projects, the kind of things that um, ask us to dream big, because if ever there is a case for public involvement in infrastructure, it's in, in the stuff that can't be done by the private sector. And water is probably the area that fits that bill best. I love seeing these things done by the private sector, but the most important thing is that they happen. It's too important to securing our future. But we should also explore, with the buy-in of the communities involved, the potential of setting up special economic zones in which there is a clear commitment from state and federal governments to very low taxes of all kinds, intense infrastructure investment, minimal red and green tape, and a welcome mat rolled out for investment. Because if we choose the sites well, oh, glad it resonates somewhere. <laughs> if we choose the sites well, 
And if you take as an example, uh, somewhere like Gladstone or Townsville, it could boost struggling areas quickly into economic powerhouses, fostering innovation and opportunity right across our economy. Imagine what this could do in getting um, entrenched, um, an entrenched, quiet economy back to life, giving it an electric shock that would resonate for decades to come. And while it would have an experimental quality, that's part of the reason why local buy-in is so important, for an area doing it tough, it is a risk worth taking, with the potential to set it up for the long term and provide the ammunition, I think, to show how these beliefs work for the bigger picture. It can be part of making the case for why we need to be much braver about doing all of these things across the board in the long term. Now, I'll wrap up with this. Some of you might be a bit disappointed that this talk wasn't more radical, that it wasn't more grand. That doesn't mean I don't um, share some of the, the grand economic things we can achieve. But the whole point is to show that there are really small, really politically achievable things that we can do even in the short term that will have a dramatic impact on the economy of this nation, on the take-home pay of all Australians and on the cost of living. If politics is the art of the achievable, well, I regard all of these things as well and truly within reach if we're willing to make the case in plain terms for their moral and political force. And there is both. Because improving productivity, as wonky as that sounds, isn't just about making our corporations more profitable, as the left might have you believe. It's not about serving the top end of town. It's about more jobs for those in our community who are most vulnerable. It's about higher take-home pay for those people who do work across the board. And it's about producing everything that we make more efficiently so that it is more affordable for everyone in our community. And that is deeply moral, it is deeply just.